Hello there. Welcome back to Fans on the Run. I'm Ethan Alexanian. I'm your omnipotent host. And just uh, so you know beforehand, if I sound odd in this episode, I have some sort of throat thing. Don't know what it is. Uh, so if I sound like I've been smoking three packs of uh, Marlboro a day for the last 60 years, you'll know why. Um, but we got a, we got a really good episode for you today. Well, it's, it's two episodes. It's, it's two episodes. It's a tribute to for, even though you don't even have to click anywhere. You'll hear one right after the other. Same video. I know it's the magic of the internet. Ah, it's fantastic. Some might even say fab or <laughs> I was going to make a pun there. I don't even know what the pun was going to be. Anyways, we got Mark Benson from 1964, the tribute up first. And then after him, you're going to hear from Artie Saraf from the Fab Four. What a combination. Like two of the best Beatles tribute bands got a John and we got a Paul. So, you know, what? I'm not going to blabber on for too long. I'm going to hand it over to past Ethan. Take it away, past Ethan. This, this is Fans on the Run, run. A, a podcast, podcast made, made by, by for, and it's at Beals fans. And, and now, here's your host, Ethan Alexanian. All right, hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Fans on the Run. Uh, not the best Beatles podcast, but an incredible simulation. Um, <laughs> we have a doozy of a guest for you today. He's the co-founder of the legendary 1964 The Tribute, which was called the best Beatles tribute on earth by Rolling Stone, and he's been praised by the likes of uh, the former general manager of Apple Records, Alistair Taylor, and Dick Clark. I don't need to explain who Dick Clark is. You may know him as John, or you may know him as Mark Benson. Mark, thank you for coming on. Hello, hello. It's nice to be on your show. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. I still remember seeing you guys uh, when I was, God, I think eight or nine at the Sony Center in Toronto, and it kind of blew my mind. It's like, wow, it's like seeing the Beatles. Well, uh, <laughs> I think I remember seeing you too. Um, it, you know, the, the strange thing to all of us is that we never, ever intended this to be a full-time endeavor. Mm -hmm. We thought this was going to be, you know, something we would do locally maybe once or twice every two months or so because we figured it was going to be a baby boomer, uh, oldest party or a class reunion kind of thing, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So we weren't looking at it as – because there really wasn't any tribute industry. There were Broadway shows about the Beatles, but – There was no Beatlemania. Was, right. <clears throat> and there were, But no one was – Performing an all Beatles sound alike look alike type show in nightclubs or or uh, theaters or any of that kind of stuff. It just wasn't being done yet. And especially uh, a Beatles tribute <clears throat> with the same kind of uh, format that you do, because uh, for the folks at home who might not know too much about 1964, they are not your typical Beatles tribute act where they you know where they start off with the suits and then they do the Sergeant Pepper. <laughs> And then all that kind of stuff. They uh, strictly focus on trying to recreate what a Beatles show in 1964, 5, 6 would look like. Yeah. So, I mean, our, our, our aim was, and all those other shows that kind of do the whole A to Z thing, uh, they're great shows. It's mm -hmm. just we wanted to really show people what it was like if you were lucky enough to get a ticket to see the Beatles in arguably the most influential and time period of the whole British invasion when they just sort of took over America. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know you play songs that aren't exactly from 1964, <clears throat> so I'm not going to call you a fraud, but... No, no. The, Be <laughs> now, the, now the Beatles toured from 64 to six, uh, 63 to 66, Yeah, and that's where we choose our music from. Now, we do songs that they didn't do <laughs> live because technically it's... Unless you're promoter and your audience is willing to only get a 30 minute show yeah uh you can't really do a beatles uh a correct beatles show because they only did 12 songs and never an encore and you'd have to get rid of your pa system entirely and exactly. just reply <clears throat> just rely on those vox amps that's right that's right so i mean i mean in a very strange way you have to sort of 
credit the Beatles with the entire, you know, promotion, promotion and advancement of sound reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Because up to that point, no one was playing, no one was filling stadiums except sporting events. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly was the first time. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So I I don't even have to elaborate. (laughs) It's just, you know, they had little, these little tiny horns on the telephone poles around the stadium to announce, you know, who was on second base and nobody cared. You could see the game. Mm-hmm. And that's all they had to sing through, through 30,000 screaming girls, you know. And that's why you hear all the stories of the people who were there. It's like you couldn't hear a damn thing. Well, and even even better than that, when Ron Howard did the uh, the uh, touring, the eight days a week touring mm-hmm. years video of the Beatles, he had some uh, input from uh, Ringo and Paul when they were looking at the footage and remembering what it was like to be touring. And you, you always kind of think in retrospect, oh, the Beatles, they were this, the biggest thing in pop music and blah, 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 blah. But you don't realize that the industry really, live performance industry really hadn't caught up yet. Mm-hmm. So here's Ringo and he, <laughs> I mean, you just imagine this. These are the best guys, man. These, these are the pop heroes. And he's saying, I couldn't hear the amplifiers. I couldn't hear the singing. We'd start the song, and the only drum they could hear was the snare drum because it cut through the screaming. If I played the tom-toms at all, they'd, th- they'd turn around and look at me like I quit playing. <laughs> so we'd start the song, and I, I knew what song it was, and we'd start, and I'd watch, and I'd watch, and I'd watch, and until they got on the mic and did some kind of like an ooh or something like that, then I'd know where we were. <laughs> yeah. Like I <laughs> heard <laughs> Ringo on some show saying – like he would have to watch Paul's foot or John's ass Mm -hmm. because he does that kind of bobbing up and down type thing. Well, when you think of that and that that's, you know, this is normal for them. It's amazing. They were as good as they were alive. Oh yeah. So Mark, I'm going to ask you about you now. I'm ready. When did you first discover the Beatles? I actually saw them on Ed Sullivan when I was 11. <clears throat> and uh, it was kind of a funny story because Sunday night was the Ed Sullivan show. Mm-hmm. And I only could ever watch half of it because I was supposed to be in bed by 8.30. Sunday night was a school night. Mm-hmm. So the Beatles were on and I got to hear the first song, but then I had to go to bed. And I'm upstairs and I can still hear the TV and it's killing me. <laughs> I was like, Dad, come on, just one time. Nope, time to go to bed. Fascists. <laughs> so uh, I've seen it many, many times since. But it, it was just uh, – and, you know, the thing that really struck so many young people was these guys didn't go to college. They're dressed in suits and they're playing – to on arguably the most popular television show in the world. And all these girls are screaming. It looks like a pretty good job. (laughs) So, you know, I mean, I think it really sort of up to that point, music has never been the uh, promising choice for a career. But once people saw that, it suddenly put it in the, in the, you know, column of that's doable. Look, these guys are doing it. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to kind of speed through the normal questions I ask for normal guests uh, because I have some specific questions. Well, (laughs) I have questions specifically for you. I'm not normal. Is this what we're talking about? You're you're normal. You're special. You're a very special oh, guest I'm to special. me. Good, Good save. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take that in anything but the highest form. <laughs> All, right. All right. What was the first Beatles album you owned? Well, the first Beatles album was the first actual album that I owned. Everything up to that point was 45s, just singles. <laughs> so Meet the Beatles was the first LP I ever owned, ever. All right, so now I want to ask um, about the history of 1964, the tribute. How did it come to be? Because up to that point, it was just uh, Beatlemania. Uh, This was the early 80s. Uh, Reissue guitars didn't really exist. The internet didn't exist. Yeah, Beatlesuits.com. Nothing. Well, um... 
every band I'd, I'd ever played in played Beatle music, but just, you know, we did our rock and roll versions of, of their songs. And I worked in a guitar repair shop and I've always been interested in the combination of guitar and amplifier and why that's important. Mm -hmm. what, what combinations of guitars and amps produced at certain sounds? Why didn't other groups in England that recorded at Abbey Road not sound like the Beatles? Mm -hmm. You know, just different things like that. You know, just the, the combinations of certain things, you know, why, why that was important. So I was always interested in sound and how to get it. And the closer, I mean, I remember being in the basement with some of the band members and we'd be fooling with some Beatles songs. And uh, somebody, uh, I think the rhythm guitar player brought, uh, brought a Gretsch guitar in one time. It, it was just like, as soon as he plugged it in and we started playing, we all were playing the same as we always played. Suddenly that sound was really different and it really piqued my interest in how far could we go to get that to sound just like it should. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we did a couple of shows that were just kind of like, uh, let's see kind of shows. And they just took off. I mean, I, I think our very first 1964 gig was at a vintage record collection uh, convention. <clears throat> so lots of people were there looking for old, old English stuff and, you know, vintage records and stuff. And they had a, a stage that several acts would perform and there were people singing Frank Sinatra songs and Beatles songs and 60s tunes and uh, lots of stuff Zeppelin bands and you know lots of stuff but it really went over big and it really kind of like made it seem doable but again we weren't thinking this is going to be a, a permanent thing I mean how many record shows are there <laughs> so I, I think it just started we'd start to play around and the more and more we played the more people would ask us back and the more uh, people would come to the shows and it just kind of like took on a life of its own after a little while. Mm -hmm. We can't talk about the uh, origin of 1964 without mentioning uh, the late Gary Grimes. Mark, Correct. is there anything you'd like to say about Gary? Well, I'd known Gary since high school. We went to the same high school, but he was uh, in a grade higher than mine. And uh, we'd always had, you know, rock and roll. Growing up in the same town, see, all the band members in the in the original 1964 lineup were all guys from the same town growing up with the same musical influences but we'd never all play and we'd go see each other's bands but we'd never played in the same band at the same time mm -hmm. so we knew each other we were you know friendly in musician circles in the same town and just the look on people's faces when it's you get you actually get together you say let's just try this guy on guitar and this guy, you know and our voices always seem to blend really well. So let's try these two guys. And just when you got the four guys in the room and it started to just, you see everybody's face like, whoa, that really sounded like the record. That was so cool. And I think it's just because no one had ever gone to that extent yet. I mean, in, in our town to try to get the sounds right and the singing right and all that stuff. We would just, like I said, we'd learn a song and sing it with, Les Pauls and Marshalls and, you know, all these, just the rock and roll stuff that we had when we were playing out. Mm -hmm. So once we started to do this, you could see the light go on in everybody's brain. Like, wow, this sound is so good. It's the way I remember it growing up. Could, could we do this? So it was kind of like that. And since Gary and I had been in so many uh, rock and roll bands together and we had a history of singing together and we had a good vocal blend that was pretty much uh, that was pretty much a given that that had to be in place. And then Gary was one of the first guys that I ever knew that played. He was a right-handed guitar player, and he never considered himself as a musician. He was a singer. He didn't really fancy himself as an accomplished guitarist or, or anything other than being a really good singer. Mm -hmm. And he learned how to play bass left-handed, even though he was not a bass player, nor was he left-handed just for that show. And it spurred so many other right-handed bass players to, you know, look at that and say, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it just, I mean, it was one of the things that kind of, I think turned the corner a little bit on the band because suddenly you've got that opposite guitar look on that side of the stage. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of essential to trying to present the Beatles I think as so. they were. <clears throat> yep. So, 
uh, you have a website called 1964 Cool Storage. I, I've I've read through it several times, um, and it's just I find it really fascinating. Uh, you talking about having to build, uh, you know, the Rickenbacker 325 copy and the 360 copy, um, because there weren't any reissue guitars like that. At the yeah, time. I I knew two people in my town that had one, but neither one wanted to sell it. <laughs> and so, you know, what do you do? Well, I worked in a guitar shop and I'd, I'd repaired and I worked on lots of Rickenbackers and I knew how they were built. And I thought, I'll just build one. <clears throat> I'll just take the time, figure it out. And so luckily for me, the two guys that, <coughs> excuse me, the two guys in town that had guitars were kind enough to let me do tracings and measurements and, you know, looking at wiring diagrams and all that kind of stuff. So I had, you know, some actual models to go from. <clears throat> so it just came down to, you know, um, you're right. There were no reissues. There were no, there was no eBay. There was no internet. So you only had your local want ads paper or like the back of some of these trade magazines like Melody Maker or Rolling Stone or some of these things just to look to see if anybody was selling anything. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there was never a way to transmit pictures. So you'd have to call someone and you'd have to, you know, depend on them to know what kind of guitar they had and be sure it was the right thing. And that was, a, that was very kind of iffy. So I just decided, you know, I can make this. And so I made this too. And I have, uh, I've used them ever since we started. So uh, I may be, I may be the only John Lennon impersonator that's never actually played a Rickenbacker. <laughs> <laughs> and you still have the original uh, 325 copy that you made in the 80s. I made two of them. I made one with the white hand guard and one with the gold hand guard. And I still play them at every show. How did you get around on the... Uh, <clears throat> white guard one the weird uh, vibrato system uh one of the things that i always found interesting about john lennon's early guitars is that they all had vibratos and he never ever used them yeah <laughs> i mean he replaced the original kaufman vibrato on his first rickenbacker the one from the late 50s yeah. with another vibrato a bigsby mm -hmm. and still never used it <laughs> Uh, I mean, I guess that's not really too hard to, um, I mean, you could have just replaced it with a trapeze bridge or some, or a tailpiece just so that you had something, but it may have been that, you know, Bigsby's were American and they were really cool. Mm -hmm. So maybe that was part of it. You know, some, some kind of Americana is on your guitar now. I don't know. Yeah. Well, because really all the sure. great American guitars of the time, uh, had <clears throat> Bigsby's and... All those types of vibratos. Yeah, it's just strange that you know you can't you can't go to any track and notice like oh, there you finally used it there it is you know there's there's no track anywhere. Yeah, I mean George used the I, mm -hmm. he used it yeah, at least absolutely. a little bit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, but John never did. Well, what, one thing that really helped us in that particular vein was using heavy gauge flat wound strings. Mm -hmm like the Beatles used, because at that time period, that was that was kind of like the going string. And uh, none of them were really, you know, tech guys or whatever. And I think if you broke a string, you just grab one from another string pack, whether it was the same brand or not, and just do it on your guitar and carry it on. Mm -hmm. So um, the heavier gauge tends to stay in tune a little bit better. Of course, I'm not playing solos. I'm playing rhythm, so I'm not doing a whole lot of bending that would make the guitar go out of, you know, go out of tune. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are playing pretty hard at it. Oh, yeah. As we're John hit, We're did. hitting them. There's no oh, question. We're hitting it. It's, if the guitar was a human, uh, I think there'd have to be a domestic <laughs> violence uh, report filed. Well, that's how a lot of people just uh, de-stress themselves is to go really play guitar hard yeah. and loud. <clears throat> Which is funny seeing those old clips of John playing and thinking, that guitar is worth like $3.5 million now. Not at the time. Not at the time. It was no, only I mean, later. Now. You know? Yeah, of course. 
Yeah. yeah. No, no question. And they weren't even that cheap back then. No, Rick and Beckers were relatively expensive guitars back then. So were Vox amplifiers. <clears throat> You brought up Vox amplifiers, and I saw, or I read this interesting thing, that you, um, for a while, uh, were building Vox amps, and you got a cease and desist letter from Vox, because you were making them too well. Um, we ran into the same thing everybody ran into. Once the airlines started to uh, revise their size and weights, uh, for being able to travel on planes. Mm -hmm. So what we had done was we had made lightweight cabinets and uh, lightweight amplifiers and lightweight speakers to get under the, the uh, restrictions so that we could still fly to certain shows. Mm -hmm. So you, you either had to do that or decide we're never flying, we're just driving to all of our shows. Yeah. <clears throat> And we decided to make the effort to, uh, the amplifiers looked the same as other amplifiers, as the Vox amplifiers, and we had the Vox logo on them. And we got, the, we didn't, the guy that made them ended up getting a cease and desist because once we, he made them for us, he started to make them for other people. And he just, he had the Vox logo on it because it looked right, but uh, we weren't like, he didn't, he didn't have a company selling them in mass or anything like that, but still, they said, you know, you got to stop making them. Yeah. But they worked really well because they were half power with one speaker instead of, they were 15 watts instead of 30. Mm -hmm. One speaker instead of two and quarter inch plywood instead of three quarter, but they were made to look like three quarter on the outside. So it would look right. Uh -huh. And you could literally pick one of these up with one hand and put it on your shoulder. Clever, clever, clever. Well, we tried, and then they did it again, so we just, <laughs> it was like, okay, right, we're done with that. <laughs> now, um, there's a bit of a family connection between uh, 1964 and myself, um, and I've heard stories of going on, t or you guys on tour, just going around the country and stopping in these little pawn shops, and... Uh, buying up old guitars. Are there any that stick out to you? Well, of course. Um, <clears throat> uh, every time we came up to uh, Canada, we used the Alexandrians for um, the sound reinforcement and lighting, and we developed such a great relationship, um, uh, close friendships and great relationship with them, uh, great company, and... Uh, you know, when we'd be in a town for more than one day, which is unusual, uh, we'd all say, let's, let's hit music stores. Let's go to pawn shops. Let's see what's around. Let's see what's going on. So it was just a fun thing. I, I, of course, we were always looking for, you know, Beatles-related equipment. And back then, you could actually find a lot of stuff. Um, there was no eBay where everybody's become a guitar expert and, you know, they're selling everything all over the world to people. And... Uh, so it, it it was not as as difficult to find things locally as it as it is now. So it was just it's just a fun way to pass the time, you know, something we're all interested in and uh, a fun day out. So yeah, we did that quite a bit. Are there any? Uh, did you find anything in particular that <clears throat> sticks out to you even to this day? No, not that I remember. I'm. I mean, I may still have guitars in my basement that I got in Canada at some of the pawn shops or music stores, but I wouldn't remember which one was which and where I got it. You're asking me to remember something in the past. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if I got to remember anything else, Ethan, I've got to delete a childhood memory. That The hard drive's full. <laughs> you know, it's not that far off from me. I, I can't remember what I did this morning. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I'd say, about a two-hour <clears throat> memory, and I just kind of... It's the short-term memory that goes first. You're on your way. Well, at least I have that to look forward to. <laughs> That's right. So, touring this, you know, experimental uh, Beatles tribute act in the 80s, um, how, what was the reception like? Well, we quickly found out that our perception of it being a baby boomer thing was completely wrong and that there was literally no 
no age group that did not like the Beatles. Um, we got hooked up very early in our career with uh, the, uh, in, in the States it's called NACA and in the Canada it's called COCA. It, they are two organizations that do college shows and they book college shows nationwide for the countries. Uh, and we thought the kids are gonna be into their nowadays music and they could not get enough. We, book, we, we set records for, no, you'd have these showcases where you'd go in and you'd play for 20 minutes and other groups would come in and play for 20 minutes. And initially, these programs were supposed to be for up and coming original acts. <laughs> and we were the first non-original act to be allowed into both of those organizations. And we set records of, of numbers of shows booked at like, you know, they'd have something for the northeastern part of Canada. And it included uh, a couple of provinces and a whole bunch of colleges. And they'd all get together and we'd do a showcase and they'd try to group by you, give you 12 or 15 shows in that area to get your price down. And we just, I mean, we booked so many shows from these things. Uh, we were the perfect parents weekend band, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but it surprised us that the kids were that into it. That, that, that between the generations, it was there was no difference in people that didn't grow up in that era and didn't witness the Beatles coming over here. They all seemed to like the music for the same reasons. It's just good music. Well, but there's a lot of good music out there. And I think that uh, one of the things that was pointed out to me a long time ago is that um, it's not just that they know Yellow Submarine and Twist and Shout. They know each Beatle. They know what they play. They know what they sing. Mm -hmm. And it's it would be like me knowing all about Tommy Dorsey and his band of you know his uh, jazz band that played for you know behind Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and all these guys, and knowing everybody in the band and knowing all about them and you know somebody far enough out of my time period to be that interested in all the little minutia of you know details and and trivia and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, you look on the internet right now, there are young people posting all kinds of clips of Hard Day's Night and Help. and I mean, it's it never seems to kind of quite get out of fashion until the next generation starts to once again start to become enthralled with this phenomenon called the Beatles. I mean, I'm, I'm a high school senior. I'm 17. <clears throat> I'm hosting a Beatles podcast. My point, you, you've made my point. <laughs> so, do you have any... Uh, uh, particular favorite stories of being on the road with 1964 in them early days. Oh man, I'm. And I don't, were... I don't want you to have to delete some childhood memories. But... <laughs> I just remember we would go out, and I mean, we literally had a Mazda GLC and a and a, an equipment truck. And we had our own PA system and all of our amps and guitars. And we would just drive from town to town to town to town. We'd be gone for three or four weeks or maybe a month and then come home. And after a while, nobody wanted to be gone that long. So we'd really concentrate on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, maybe Sunday, come home Monday, be home Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then once again, go out again. <clears throat> and I mean... I think the thing I remember the, uh, the most is just the appreciation and kind of like the surprise that I had that everywhere you look, you're seeing two or three generations of a family sitting together and everyone singing all the same words. And at the end of the show, no one during the show is going, can we go now? Mm -hmm. You know, nobody's kind of like left out of the enjoyment. And at the end of the show, they leave happy. So I think, you know, um, you always have these memories of, you know, the, <clears throat> I remember one particular time there was a, a blizzard coming back from Canada and they closed the Peace Bridge and uh, we had to drive uh, along the, the uh, northern, northeastern coast of Canada and come back in through uh, upstate New York. <clears throat> but they closed, the, uh, they closed the interstate, they closed the to tollway and uh, we were driving, I said, like I said, in this Mazda. And about every 45 minutes, we'd have to stop because 
the snow was so deep that it was like getting thrown up under and we'd pull up the, uh, the car would just stop and we'd pull up the hood and there was snow all in with the engine because it was run, running up from underneath with the wheels. <laughs> but we made it to the next gig. That's <clears throat> Canada. And, you know, we'd been up all night, drove all along and made it to the next gig with no sleep and got on stage and, and performed. But it was, you know, those kind of things that, you know, it's like... <laughs> You, you never tend to forget that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that is a pretty accurate representation of Canada in the winter. So. Yeah, and but you guys are all used to it, and you guys are all really good. You, your snow removal systems are incredible, <clears throat> and it's just, you know, it's no big deal. Yeah. I think that the thing that was also amazing to us about Canada is that there were donut shops combined <laughs> with other shops that you would never think they would combine with. It was like auto repair and donut shop or, you know, uh, draperies and donuts. And, you know, it was just like everywhere. It was so great. <laughs> uh, well, I remember, I, guess... I remember always going into the Tim Hortons and seeing the big hockey picture of Tim Horton on the wall and asking the people behind the counter, who's that guy? And they would go, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can't you and you can you can't go a kilometer without seeing at least two timmies well and that's you know what that's great though i mean you get great coffee nice warm uh comfort food <clears throat> canadians don't seem to be any less healthy than anybody else so on the surface. <laughs> That's the phrase I like to use when people are talking about Canada. It's like, oh, you guys seem so happy. And so, on the surface. It's because, you, it's because you have a border to protect you. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't dig any deeper. Okay. All right. So, what is... Um, your favorite Beatles song to play live? Uh, well, there's probably two answers to that question. One is the one that goes over the best, and the other one that would be my personal favorite. Um, I've always liked, because, you know, in our show, we do most of the well-known hits. Yeah. So um, it would be hard to find a song that goes over better than Twist and Shout. <clears throat> really? Yeah. I mean, because everybody likes to get up and just have at it, and they can all sing along on the Oz parts and the build up, and you know, we involve them and we tell them to sing along, and it's it's just like a, it's about halfway through the show, and it gives them a little break to stand up instead of sit throughout the whole thing, and they just go crazy. Something but, that uh, <clears throat> sticks out in my mind when I remember seeing you guys is uh, when you did in my life, you would have everyone take out their uh, phones and call someone and just that quote sticks with me uh this is so wrong for a 60s show yeah <clears throat> yeah it, it, it that again it you can't you you can't do a accurate Beatles show in today's uh, society because i mean even if you don't take, tell people to take out their phones they've got their phones out filming us anyway you know <clears throat> yeah but that's such a you know and that's you never, ever know who's going to connect with you when that happens, which is what I love about it. People are, you know, I just say, you know, call someone who's really important to you and, you know, we'll make it much bigger than this place. And it's so great to just let people connect with someone. Mm -hmm. It might be someone that isn't, list, you know, that they're leaving a message to, but when they get this message, it's just this wonderful, I love you kind of message. And the fact that, you know, it's not even the song that's important. It's the, the thing that's important is you took the time to reach out to somebody and let them know you were thinking of them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a huge thing. That's just, I, I don't know. It, it seems like it's just not, not done enough these days. No, I think it's, it's perfect. Uh, while it may not be 100% technologically accurate to how the Beatles were, but it, it keeps the spirit of <clears throat> what they kind of would have done if that technology was around. Well, it, and, and to that end, I mean, occasionally we do meet and greets after these shows, and 
typically when parents bring children, they're a little bit timid when they come through the line to say hello and everything. They're usually hiding behind mom's legs or whatever. That was me. <clears throat> and I don't know, about a year ago, uh, there was a six-year-old little girl named Ashley that came through the line and she was just on fire. She was just bouncing all over the place, jumping up and down before she got to the table where we were and smiling and making googly faces and all this stuff. And, you know, definitely not shy. <clears throat> and she comes up and um, I said, you look really happy. And she goes, I am. I said, why are you so happy? And she looks at me and she says, because of love. Oh. And I thought that wouldn't have made as big an impact on me if an adult said that. But the fact that this six-year-old girl who just totally unedited, you know, uh, unscripted, and she just blasted out like that. Um, it just really hit me that I was supposed to be reminded of that. Now, you know, I, I've always known, people always say, why do you think the Be Beatles have lasted so long? And my answer has always been, it's it's love. They're, it's in almost every one of their songs. It's in most of their song titles. Um, you know, it's just, you know, their most famous songs are... Imagine we're, you know, all one, uh, all you need is love, you know, um, all my love and she loves you, you know, this, you can go on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's inspired me to go back through our entire song list and all the things we say and look for those four letters, L O V where uh, E, whether it's love, lover, lovely, loving, whatever, whatever the word is. And over 120 times in one night, you sing or hear us sing that word. The word love. In some form in the song, yes. And if I told an audience, I'm going to get you all to sing I love you, they'd be like, yeah, right. <clears throat> and then we do eight days a week and when we break, everybody in that place goes, I love you. <laughs> and it's just, it's because they know it. It's because it's a Beatles song, it's popular, it's fun. And there is a vibration to that word. There is there is a significance to that. And hearing it and saying it and singing it over and over and over in a pop song tends to have an effect on people that when they leave, they're really happy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, in, I was reminded by that little girl that that's no small part of it. How does it feel knowing that you and 1964 The Tribute um, are some of the major factors of like the Beatles or let me rephrase that. Uh, you're, you're carrying on the Beatles legacy. How does that make you feel knowing that um, for so many people, um, I lost my train of thought there. Take your time. Yeah, see, I told you it's it's the, it's the it's the immediate members that go first. Yeah, see this it's I've said this on many episodes. <clears throat> Fans on the run is the podcast where the host has no idea what the fuck he's doing. <laughs> okay, Ugh, let me try that again. <laughs> How does it feel knowing that you are carrying on the Beatles legacy? Um, I, th I think the way I look at that is look at the number of groups that are doing that. And it reflects to me how much there is a need for people to hear positive things like this. Mm -hmm. Positive messages in rock and roll, great music, great songwriting. I mean, there's almost no Beatles song. You can't just, as soon as you start to hear it, you start singing along. Mm -hmm. Even if you, you don't consider yourself a big, you know, I know all the trivia, I'm a huge fan, I have all the records, I have the movies, blah, blah, blah. You just know it from hearing it for so long. And um, as I said, it's interesting to me that generations that didn't grow up with it like it for the same reasons, and to be in particular segment of society, like 18-year-olds to 23-year-olds don't like to be, you know, there's no age group or even section of age group that, that, Blanketly doesn't like the Beatles. I mean, there are people, of course, but I mean, yeah, people are I allowed to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm happy to belong to something that is 
as positively motivating as this and that sends such a nice message and that makes people feel good and promotes families getting together and doing things. I get emails from from girls and guys that say, you know, this is the one thing I do every year with my dad. I buy the tickets and I take him. And it's like, that's, that's tremendous. Mm-hmm. It, it must make you feel just great knowing that you are um, kind of keeping the Beatles music alive in a sense. <clears throat> well, um, I think it's nice. I think, I think, I'm not necessarily keeping the music alive, but I'm I'm providing a fun live performance to go see as opposed to staying at home and watching Hard Day's Night again or listening to your records at home. Now you can go out and look at a band doing this. And there are many other groups that do this too. And it's, you know, I think it's something that generally speaking, most of the world really, really enjoys. Mm-hmm. I should mention that when this is uploaded, uh, it'll be kind of a, part one of a two-parter interview episode where um, I'm also interviewing uh, Artie from the Fab Four. Artie's worked with us on several occasions. Um, great singer, bass player, another guy that learned how to play left-handed bass, who is a righty. Uh, great talent. I think I have him scheduled for next week. I'm mm-hmm. 85% <laughs> sure it will happen. <laughs> <clears throat> you didn't answer my question from earlier. What is your personal favorite Beatles song oh, to play? Oh, oh okay. Um, short-term memory loss. Um, Don't mean to throw you under the bus. Uh, I think one of my favorite sort of B-sides is Yes, It Is. I just think that's hauntingly beautiful, and it was a song that John described as a this boy that didn't work, and I couldn't disagree more. I think it's just lovely. I think it's really, really beautiful. Mm-hmm. The you know the three part harmonies, and, and we don't do it often, mm-hmm. but it's and uh, I think there's a lot of people that really are unfamiliar with that song because you just hardly ever hear it. But it's uh, you know in the in the in the pacing of a show, you've got to be careful not to do too many slow songs, yeah, and you know get the whole theme of the show slowed down too much. And there's so many good ballads. I mean. I would never do Yes It Is instead of If I Fell or uh, Michelle or, uh, you know, things like that that are just such great songs and so well known. But uh, occasionally, and sometimes it's when we work with an orchestra, we'll throw that in. And it's just such a it's such a nice departure from our normal song list. Mm-hmm. On that same note, but kind of a, a flip side, what is your least favorite Beatles song to play live? Um, I don't have one. I can't really say what that is. Uh, and, and I think it's, like I said, it's because the other thing to consider here is that um, as in any group that stays together for a really long time, you build up this chemistry. And just working together is really, really fun and rewarding. And, you know, I look forward to when Ringo sings and when George sings and and we can, Paul and I can just, you know, do backup vocals or not sing at all. And it's, you know, it's something like Roll Over Beethoven or something like that. It's just great. It's really good because I'm still a fan of all those songs and of the Beatles. So when I get to hear those guys, you know, step up to the spotlight, it's just, it's great. Mm-hmm. I don't think I have a least favorite song to sing. Or, I'm su- or- I guess I, I could say I'm surprised that certain songs don't that I really think are, are great songs and that you never hear anybody do don't seem to go over or get the applause that I, I would think they'd get. And it might be, um, I mean, we, we do a version of and your bird can sing mm-hmm. and I love it because Tom does such a great job about playing both solo parts at the same time. Mm-hmm. And there are people that come through and say, what was the song about? The, what was the song tonight about the birds? I don't, I've never heard that one. So, I mean, it's, it's understandable, you know, on a song you've never heard that uh, you wouldn't be as thrilled about or screamy yelly about, but you know. I'm surprised someone would be coming to a Beatles show and not know and your bird can sing. Oh, I'm not at all. I mean, there are so many levels of people that love the Beatles and sometimes, you know, they're getting brought by someone who's a fan and they haven't really spent that much time listening to the Beatles. Although, they're more familiar with it than they realize just because it's always been on. Mm-hmm. 
So there are some songs from that, you know, 64 through 66 or 63 through 66 period that I don't think I've ever heard you guys do live. Um, one that sticks out, she said, she said, have you ever done it? We've done it in rehearsal, but uh, we've not, I don't believe we performed that one live. Uh, we have performed Dr. Robert. Um, um, think for yourself. Um, other sort of uh, rubber sole revolver records that are uh, a little less well known, I guess you could say. But yeah. yeah, that's one. That's one we haven't performed live. You're right. I was gonna say, will we ever <clears throat> see 1964 do "Tomorrow Never Knows"? <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> um, probably not, unless we're unless we're unless we're playing at like a you know um, uh, a marijuana convention or something like that. Maybe <laughs> maybe that that could be something that uh, the crowd. We could do like a twenty minute version, you know, <laughs> with a with a drum solo that's more of a dance record, the kind of thing, you know. <laughs> Just slowly morph into Inagata de Vida. <laughs> There you go. There you go. <clears throat> so, apart from, uh, let's remove the 1964 context for a second. What is your favorite Beatles song, period? Not one that you'd like to play live or uh, like to hear the crowd go wild for. It. What's your favorite Beatles song? I, uh, You know what? I can't pick one. Because just when I start to think about, you know, is there one above all the rest? It, it's... I think my um, you can pick more than one. Uh, well, I mean, you know, most of I mean, I do have a couple of B sides that I really like, but I mean, as soon as you start talking about it, you realize, yeah, but that's a good song too, and oh man, I love that one too, and you know, it, it just goes on and on and on. Sergeant Pepper was a huge, you know, departure from their normal sound and everything, and it was a really great sounding record. Really loved it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, She's Leaving Home was an incredible, you know, incredible effort. Um, but then, you know, um, there's so many early songs. Uh, I love their covers of the Marvelettes, like um, Really Got a Hold on Me, you know, that kind of stuff. They were huge fan of, fans of Motown and blues and things like that. Well, it certainly uh, turned me on to Motown. And well, and that's, that was Spectre the fun thing when people would hear Roll Over Beethoven or they'd hear, uh, you know, like I said, uh, <clears throat> Marvelettes and songs they'd cover, they'd go, wow, these are cool Beatles songs, because they didn't realize they were covering someone else's songs. Mm -hmm. So I, it did put some of those artists kind of on the map. Mm -hmm. you know? I heard a quote saying uh, the Beatles kind of gave American music back to them that originally kind of went over people's heads. Well, in certain instances, uh, their versions of... Um, their versions of cover, you know, their covers of other tunes did kind of uh, alert people. Uh, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing to think, oh, that's a guy from the United States and he's had that record out for six years. Why didn't I know that? <laughs> Why haven't I heard that? <clears throat> but yeah, they're covered. And of course, you know, they made it their own and they did things their own way. And I mean, they turned everything they did into a Beatles song. So it would be natural to be confused about you know the origin of the song yeah so do you have a least favorite beatles song um no not really i mean i can't see myself doing old brown shoe but really but uh you know <clears throat> that's just me yeah i i love old brown shoe well you know you're allowed to you're allowed to be wrong I see what you did there. You threw it back in my face. <laughs> Tears in my eyes. <laughs> what is your favorite Beatles album? Can't do it. I can't really. There's just too many good ones. I mean, put anyone on and for as long as the album spins, you're just like, God, this is good. This top, is so top well, and three? This is, and this is this is the thing, you know. Most groups have 
on any given record one or two recognizable songs. Mm -hmm. And the rest are just album cuts. Most groups had at least a central figure and a backing group, or maybe a duo and a backing group. Mm -hmm. And the Beatles just surpassed all of that by being four naturally charismatic guys, all of whom could hold the spotlight, all of whom could play and sing. I mean, when you think of, I mean, this is why, you know, you say John Paul, George, and Ringo, everybody knows who you're talking about. Do you know any of the names of the guys in the Herman's Hermits or Dave Clark Five? I do know the Dave Clark Five, but that's just because no, I'm me. But do you know, but you see what I mean. Yeah. You, you know Dave Clark, obviously. You know Peter Noon, but do, are any of the other guys ever really featured on anything? Or, you know, and, and yeah. this was... And this was arguably one of the questions, uh, the biggest questions when they first started out. They, people would always say, well, who's your leader? Who's the who's the singer? Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, we all sing. And it was just like, what? There's no like front person, no, you know, central figure. And what that did was, and it really hit home with me during the anthology when George, in one of his interviews, he said, I always felt bad for Elvis because he had to be Elvis on every song. Yeah. We and there can, were four of them. We, we could do, I mean, they were so versatile. And when you think that in any group that has, you know, I mean, think of it. You, you, got, a, you got a songwriting team like John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Never mind just the songwriting. Great singers. That the drummer in that band has a number one hit. Who has that? For, for the most part, how many groups can you name the drummer? It's... Like, even the Stones, arguably uh, the Beatles' kind of, con or biggest contemporary, you can only really name Mick and Keith and well, maybe and like Brian you said, Jones. Yeah, fans know all the stuff, but generally speaking, Mick and Keith are the ones that are out front the most. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. that there is more of a sort of a, you know, there's a focal point, and then the rest of the guys could be interchanged. And to some degree, not a lot, but I mean... You know, Ronnie Wood came out. He's not an original Stone. They've no. lost Bill Wyman, and they carry on, and they don't seem to have lost any traction or you know any fans or anything like that. So to you know, like I said, to some degree, <coughs> it's the Mick and Keith show. Yeah, like I saw the Stones last year, and even though they're not really the same Stones as they were, it still felt like the Stones because it's, and, of Mick and, and Keith. And yet they are because that's the focal point of the band and they still got Charlie. Yeah, still got Charlie Watts. And, you know, you can go on about the um, how good is Ringo, how good is Charlie, are they great drummers and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter if they're a great drummer. That <laughs> chemistry is what sells the stones. When the Who lost Keith Moon, they lost a huge part of their sound. Mm -hmm. And not in, t in my opinion... Not until they got uh, uh, Ringo's son, Zach, Zach, who, I mean, I don't know if you know the history, but Zach was able to spend more time with Keith growing up than his dad because his dad was always gone. Yeah. And he kind of learned a lot. from, And he bought the same kit. He plays. He holds the sticks the same. He does every lick the same. And they sound like the who again. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I saw them not long ago, and I was fully expecting old guys to kind of, sort of, maybe sound good. They were incredible. Mm -hmm. They were just unbelievable. The only thing I, I'd have to take away points for or from is they haven't been able to recreate the sound of John N. Whistle, though. Uh, that's a, I mean, I don't know of anybody that could. Yeah. He, he's Thunderfingers, <laughs> I mean, for God's sakes. It, indeed, he is. And just, it's such a, an unorthodox approach to the bass guitar that worked so well in that band. He was, even, even I mean, McCartney's bass lines are really great bass lines. And in, especially, at, you know, once you got into Sgt. Pepper, he was playing these melodic bass lines that, that were as, as influential as the lead vocal, mm -hmm. you know, a little help from my friends is a perfect example of that. But <laughs> and Twistle was playing bass and lead at the same time yeah. <laughs> and it didn't get in front in, in the way of anybody. <laughs> it was no. great. <laughs> I heard a thing that said 
the who they all sound like they're just playing one instrument and that instrument is just loud <laughs> well that's true i mean but that's why we love the who how the hell did we get talking about the who <laughs> well there's there's a there's a relationship there <clears throat> yeah you talk about this is a story i'm not sure if you're aware of this but um I was listening to, and you know, you can you can cut this out if you want to. I, I was listening to NPR the other day, and there was a mathematician on there, who's uh, talking about this book that he wrote about how integrally involved uh, biochemistry and high math is. And they were saying things like, <clears throat> "This blew my mind because I'd never heard this before." <laughs> Initially, when we just had um, X-rays. They're, they're just one flat picture. It's just a one-dimensional picture. And so when you see an x-ray of the head, you see gray area where the brain is, but you don't see detail of a brain. It's just gray. It's just like somebody colored gray marker, and that's where the brain is. Mm -hmm. So with calculus and biochemistry, they figured out a way where you could take lots of these x-rays at different angles to envelop the whole head, and then through calculus, put all these things together and they developed the CAT scan machine. And the reason they were able to develop this was because EMI invested heavily in this technology. And the reason they did was because they had this glut of money from the Beatle record sales. <laughs> so at arm's length, <laughs> the Beatles are involved in why we have CAT scan machines today. <laughs> I love that story. I'll have to add that to the list of why the Beatles are the most influential group of all time. Unbelievable. Did the Dave Clark Five give us cat scans? <laughs> no. If you've ever had a cat scan and you're not a Beatles fan, you should be. <laughs> uh, well... EMI did have a lot of money. Oh, God. Uh, it's, anyway. it's, the, it's the Beatle rip, ripple effect, you know? It just yeah. crosses all industries. <laughs> yeah, you know, the six degrees of separation. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny, too, is that um, I'll remember shows when we first started where we were doing outdoor shows at uh, happy hour uh, outside in a parking lot, and there would be all these guys in business suits standing out the front with a drink in their hand. And then these bikers would show up with all their vests and colors on and all this kind of stuff. And they'd come walking in the crowd and we'd hit the first chord for hard day's night. And the business guys would look at the bikers and they'd look at the businessmen and they'd both go hard day's night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the walls came down and everybody was just a Beatle fan. It was so cool that it's just this kind of prominent. Right, exactly. It's kind of common denominator, you know? Yeah. Because <clears throat> everyone loves the Beatles. <sighs> it's like the one of the very few things in this world that I think we can all agree on. Right. Yeah. The Beatles are awesome. Anyways, Mark, thank you so much for coming on this ragtag little <laughs> podcast. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate you uh, reaching out to me and uh, asking me to do it. Yeah. Well, you know, you're part of the reason, uh, you in 1964, uh, are the reason why I kind of got into the Beatles further than I would have. Are you blaming me? Is that what you're doing? Uh, yes, I am <laughs> blaming you. It's my fault, huh? Okay. I yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. I, I kid because I love. <laughs> I kid because I love. But anyways, I'm I'm very gracious for your your time today. Um, where can people find you after all of this quarantine stuff is done? Uh, that is a great question. I don't think anyone knows or has any real understanding of when the kind of gatherings that are involved in music shows are going to open up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of people that say this is all bunk and there's a lot of people that say, no, it's not over. And uh, with all the places that are starting to open up now and trying to maintain some kind of guidelines, uh, group gatherings are definitely not on the list yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll do even better. In the meantime, while you can't see 1964 live, 
go on to Spotify and stream their albums, uh, Bootleg Volume 1, uh, Nine Hours in November, and then there's another one just called 1964, stream the hell out of them. We have a new record for sale, it's called Something Newer. Really? <laughs> and we have, it's on our website, oh. and we've got a bunch of t-shirts. Um, you just reminded me of something that I wanted to ask. Okay, so a couple years ago, I, I've been following guys on Facebook. Um, how did you acquire the copyright to uh, Swan and Toily? <clears throat> uh, a friend of mine who does trademark work and is a Beatle fan mentioned to me that uh, you should get online and see if uh, some of those early labels that the Beatles were using before Capital finally signed them are available or if they're have gone by the wayside. Uh, there was Swan, Tolly, and VJ mm -hmm. were some of the ones. Um, so I looked them all up, and VJ was and still is uh, at arm's length part of Parlophone Records. So that was not available. But Swan and Tolly had been out of business since 67. Because mm -hmm. once the, they pretty much got put on the map from the Beatles uh, singles, and yeah. once they got signed to Capitol, it was pretty much over. Yeah. So they were available, and I decided I would purchase them. <clears throat> and we've released a couple of 45s. We don't have any in stock right now because the, the, the run uh, ended. But we have, you know, we had 45s uh, with the same exact songs. Uh, she Loves You and I'll Get You on uh, Swan. And uh, uh, the Tolly record was... Twist uh, and Shout and There's a Place? Yes, Twist and Shout and There's a Place. Good for you. Let me know if you guys are doing a second run because I would love to snag me a <clears throat> copy or two. All right. I will. That's not out of the question. We may do that. I know a guy that's uh, good at pressing uh, vinyl, so we may end up doing some of that. Because I think that's just <clears throat> awesome that you got the <laughs> the copyright for the labels. Well, I mean, it was just sitting there. You might as well use it, right? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, when in Rome. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm glad for the, uh, the friendship that I've had with your family for quite some time now. And uh, at your convenience, please say hello to anybody that uh, would want to hear from me <laughs> if there's anybody left. <laughs> I will. And uh, thanks so much. This has been a great. This has been a great, uh, great time for me. The pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me. And Talk soon, okay. All right. Everyone else right. out there, ta -ta for now. Fans on the Run is produced by Ethan Alexander. Additional voiceovers by Richard Fellow. This has been a Showtown production. Aw, wasn't that cool? I, I, good episode, you know? Uh, I say that as the most unbiased person. You know, I'm my own biggest critic and my own biggest fan. But yeah, Mark Benson, 1964 The Tribute. Go check him out. Uh, even though it's a pandemic and no one's playing live anywhere. Uh, go check them out. Go play their albums on Spotify. Do that. Uh, but coming up now, we have uh, Artie Seurat from the Fab Four, the other best Beatles tribute in the world. And I'm going to hand it over to slightly more recent Ethan, hence the awful sounding voice because of the aforementioned uh, smoker's voice affliction that I woke up with. Anyways, enough about me. Let's hand it over to myself. This is Fans on the Run, a podcast made by, for, and about Beatles fans. And now, here's your host, Ethan Alexander. All right, welcome back to Fans on the Run, even though you haven't left. Uh, again, part two, we got a, we got a good guest for you. I don't, I don't skimp on this stuff. All right, he is the Emmy Award-winning co-founder of the Fab Four, which was named the best Beatles show in the world by the Los Angeles Times, as opposed to this podcast, which was named the worst Beatles podcast in the world by myself. You may, <laughs> you may know him as Paul, or you may know him as Artivan Saraf. Artie, thanks for coming on. Hey, no worries, man. Good to be with you, Ethan. All right, so I think I'm just going to jump into it. Artie. When did you first discover the Beatles? Well, I discovered the Beatles, believe it or not, um, right when John Lennon was murdered in uh, 1980. Um, I basically, I had 
started listening to Everly Brothers and Elvis, all my mom's old records, actual old records, vinyls. <laughs> and uh, my sister made a John Lennon tribute, like album, like a photo album, you know, like a memorial album. I'm like, why, why did everybody love this guy? Who was he, you know? And uh, to tell you the truth, I thought it was George. I mean, I saw their faces when, as a kid, and I didn't know which, who was who. I just thought it was the guy that, that I thought looked like my uncle, who was George, you know, because I have an uncle that looks like George. So I thought, oh, I guess it's that guy. But uh, lo and behold, it was John. And um, that was kind of my discovery. And the Red and Blue albums were next. And I, um, I started reading the lyrics because back then they had the lyrics on the uh, sleeve of the records. <laughs> and it just got me, just like it, it did 20 years, 30 years before that, you know. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you what was your first Beatles album, but you just kind of said it. The Red yeah. and Blue. The Red and Blue, yeah. Apart from The Red and Blue, what was the first proper Beatles album that you ever listened to? Um, it was actually, well, it was the, the VJ introducing the Beatles. Okay. That was my first introduction to a complete album, all that early stuff. So Really? I had, yeah, that was, that was it. That was the album. So of course, back then... Um, we're talking, uh, yeah, gosh, a long time ago. Um, you don't have to specify how long it was. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm trying to think, uh, you know, I, they didn't have access to the British version on vinyl anymore, I don't think. So all I was getting were VJ and some of the Capital stuff, uh, little by little, they started, you know, coming out. And of course, the CDs hit, you know, in the mid 80s, and that was it. And everybody heard all these all these great things you never heard before on a record. Mm -hmm. um, what do the Beatles mean to you? The Beatles to me, well, I think it's the same as everybody that's ever heard the music. Um, the Beatles mean everything to me. And when I say that, I mean they make an impact with almost every song that they've done. I mean, if you think about it, they were only together for really seven, eight years recording together. Mm -hmm. They were all the early 20s to mid to late 20s when they broke up. And the amount of music and the, the, the amount of quality music, the, the amount of variety that they had in their music, it, it, it will never be matched. Not only would the songs never be touched by any band ever. It just, it just won't. It's impossible. But... Um, they just mean they, they mean the supreme <laughs> the supreme um, way how to how to write songs that people connect with you know not just the song it's they they sing something they their whole career was about all you need is love you know that was pretty much that pretty much sums it up for me and you I I would imagine have a different perspective on the Beatles since uh, well you've been playing one of them for the last twenty something years. Yeah, yeah. How One of the original founders of the Fab Four, we started the band in late late ninety six ish, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to ask you, how did you start the Fab Four? Um, we started it um, basically. Long story short, on that uh, there was Beatle conventions going on. There used to be called Beatle Fest. Okay, mm -hmm. they had. Um, Chicago, New York, and LA had Beatle Fest, and they're still going on. <laughs> yeah, they're called something different now. Fest for fans, I think. Yeah. Um, but anyway, long story short, they had a battle of the bands uh, one particular weekend because the band Liverpool that played every that was the house band for Liver for Beatle Fest. Apparently, mm -hmm. one of the guys' wives was having a kid, so they couldn't do it. So they had auditions, and they asked everybody that wanted to play and do like a half an hour showcase. Uh, three bands on Saturday night, three bands on Sunday night. We submitted a tape. We got in, and with my my friends from high school, and uh, we just we're just Beatle fans. We didn't try to dress up like them, didn't try to talk like them. We just I showed up playing a right-handed bass guitar, mm -hmm. and uh, we we won four years in a row after that. So, <laughs> you know, we were that was my introduction to the Beatle band business because that that's how I met Rolo, who was the original Fat Four drummer, mm -hmm. and through him, Ron. Ron McNeil. So that's kind of where it developed. And then it turns out years later, Ron and I uh, ran into each other through another mutual friend. And we decided, hey, let's, let's put a band together. Let's let's put a Beatle band together that we would love to see and we would want to aspire to, you know, if we weren't in it. So I sold my right-handed bass guitar, my Hofner, and I bought a lefty. 
And I just started going, let's do it. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it. That's that's actually something I really admire as a, a musician, like bass player myself. Um, learning how to play uh, your instrument in a different orientation just kind of just makes me respect you even more. Because I've tried to play left-handed. I It's best if I don't. <laughs> Actually, it's probably best if I don't even play right-handed. Um, yeah, it can't be that bad. But it, it's definitely something different. It messes with your head, you know? Yeah. Just got the hands mixed up. and It's all about the left hemisphere of your brain controlling your right and vice versa. That's how it, you know, right now, since, you know, no bands are out there touring, obviously because of the pandemic, um, you know, most of my guitars at home are right-handed. So I've been doing an every Monday uh, live show on Facebook just to keep my chops up and keep singing and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, play picking up a right-handed guitar and playing it for, you know, hours at a time. I haven't been able to do that for years. Yeah. So it kind of, it, it, my hands were cramped up the first few days when I was doing it. My head was kind of, I, I'm not used to doing it. And then I turn lefty if I want to pick up a bass guitar so, or whatever guitar that's left-handed around here. My hand will cramp up again because it, it just messes with you, mm -hmm. you know. I, I've seen pictures of your guitar collection, and I'm not going to say I'm jealous. Okay, I will say I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, you know, I think you have too many Rickenbacker basses. If you ever want to throw one away, uh, I'll I'll gladly be a recipient. Uh, I'm looking at them right. I'm looking at them right now as you said that. <laughs> and you even got the the Ricky with the custom paint job, right? That's right. That was my uh, second. That was my second Rickenbacker. It's actually, for the technical musical people, this was the C-Series Rickenbacker reissue of McCartney's actual model. Mm -hmm. um, and I painted it myself. I did the Magical Mystery Tour paint job myself. That's the one with the uh, reversed headstock, right? Correct. It's got a, it's got a right-handed headstock. Yeah. And, well, you've also got, like, the Gretches and the John Lennon short scales. and. Oh, yeah. I'm a yeah. Beatle, Beatle fan galore. I mean... I'll, I'll give you a quick, uh, a, a quick story for you about my Rickenbacker. The very first Rickenbacker I ever bought, my dream guitar as a kid, was a Rickenbacker John Lennon guitar. So back in 99, I found one at a guitar center. I had to drive about 45 minutes to go get it. I called them and asked them to make sure before I drive out, do they have that guitar on the wall? The guy says, I'm looking at it right now. Come and, come and get it. So I went down to get it, bought the guitar, my dream guitar. Uh, you know, I made fake ones before in high school, in uh, junior high and all that stuff as a kid because I always wanted one. Couldn't afford it. Couldn't afford it, of course. But when I finally got one, and I, I'm, I'm looking at that right now as we speak, it's uh, my, still my baby, one of my, my, my one of my favorite guitars. I think they're even more expensive now than they were then. And that's they also are. my dream guitar. So now it seems even more unattainable. I think I have a, oh, I have a copy somewhere in my closet uh, it's like a Tokai yeah, uh, Rickenbacker. It, you can get some decent copies online. Yeah. And stuff, yeah. Well, if you want to do it kind of sneakily, you can order from some of these Chinese websites. And... Yep, you sure can. And they're not bad, you know, for the money they cost. They're not they, bad at all. They aren't bad. And I don't know if I could see myself paying two to $3,000 more. Although, yeah. although when you get the Chinese copies, you have to, like, replace all the hardware. It's... Yeah, it, for, for a, a, a casual fan who wants a guitar, a Beatle guitar, unless you're doing it for a living and if, unless you can't afford it, you know, there's no, there's no reason not to get something that's close enough. It, you know, it's not, it, only the musicians are going to know it's not the exact one, you know. I mean, I, I'd say um, I have more Beatles guitars than my friends. <laughs> All right, so... I've got some questions about things that I've read online about the Fab Four. None I've... of them are true. None of them are true. <laughs> no, All I mean, of them are lies. These are good things, though. <laughs> so, back in, I think it was 2009, uh, you guys, were you asked by Disney and Robert Zemeckis to be in this, uh, never made, Yellow Submarine remake? We sure were. Yeah, we actually did the filming for a few weeks in uh, in Santa Monica, the Santa Monica area. Um, uh, it's a shame that that never stopped, you know, in any uh, finish. It never got finished because the funding was pulled by Disney. Yeah. 
for, for reasons that, you know, we understand because I guess a couple of his, his movies before that, um, Mars, Mars Needs Moms really tanked and that, that was a big flop for Disney. Um, and I think at that point they go, well, you know what, uh, even though it's the Beatles, I mean, you think that would be gold, right? Oh, yeah. And it looked amazing. We did all we did all the filming for it for the most part. It was pretty much all in the can. Really? And uh, oh yeah, we did all the um, all the motion capture stuff and all the songs that we were doing. And um, it just it turned out to be just too much for Disney, you know. Unfortunately. Uh, how did it feel actually playing one of the Beatles in a Beatles sanctioned project? Like, for all intents and purposes, I mean, you weren't the voice, but you were Paul McCartney. Yeah, it was, uh, it was cool. It was very cool. And, you know, we had, uh, we had, a, we had some good people that we, we met doing that. We got to meet Danny Harrison and Olivia, George's widow. They came out for a day and hang out, hung out all day during the filming. Um, all, all sorts of cool stuff. We were talking to Danny about his dad's, uh, you know, Fender, psychedelic, uh, Rocky guitar. Yeah. And he was looking at ours that we had there and saying, oh, no, this color's a little off. This one's close. But, you know, it was really cool. We had a lot. We had a great time. Of course, you know, getting directed by Robert Zemeckis was a thrill, too. Yeah. He's a great guy. I so mean, that was cool. It was very cool. Uh, speaking of motion capture, isn't it also true that you guys uh, were responsible for the motion capture stuff for the Beatles rock band game? We sure were. About 95% of it. I, apparently, there was like one song or two songs. It's not us. Um, but when it's the group stuff, that's all us doing all that stuff. I remember that vividly. And we did that in New York um, for a few days. That was that was pretty cool. But when we saw it for the first time, when when the game came out, that was like it was just weird. It was bizarre. Again, because for all intents and purposes, your movements were Paul McCartney. That's right. That's right. People don't understand that that's what it is. People think, oh, they had the Beatle characters. Just they, Somehow they pulled it from Beatle footage, and that's Paul's movements. It's like, nope, nope, that's not Paul. <laughs> that's me. I think that's, that's just a testament to the uh, accuracy of the Fab Four. Yeah, I think, you know, we've definitely, that's, that's the one thing about us, Ethan. And, you know, um, I'll, I'll have to give kudos and, and a, a nice plug to Mark Benson, too, because Mark in 64, along with Gary, mm -hmm. Gary Grimes, the original um, his the partner late, in the original the Paul. Gary Grimes. Yeah, he was such a sweet guy. He used to, uh, just a quick a couple quick stories, he used to send me Christmas cards every year. And I, I barely knew him, but he was a sweet guy. Um, I actually did a show with them. Years and years ago in San Diego, I helped fill out, fill, do a fill-in for him. I don't know if Mark told you that, but he did. I did. He did yeah. mention that. Yeah, so um, those are great guys. And Mark, you know, he was a trailblazer of sorts. Uh, after Beatlemania, the Broadway show, mm -hmm. they, I guess, 64 kind of got together. And uh, they, they did a lot, of, a lot of groundwork for all of us that are following them, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of kudos to Mark and even the new guys that they have. We know, you know... Uh, Mac Ruffing used to play with Ron, mm -hmm. our, our John Lennon guy. Those guys used to play together in a band years ago, in a Beatle band. Yeah. So it's funny how things, you know, everybody knows everybody. Yeah. I mean, it seems that the world of Beatles tribute bands is smaller than one might think. It sure is. I, I'll let you in on uh, a little observation I had. Um, a while ago, I was thinking about Beatles tributes, and I was in my head kind of imagining what my ultimate Beatles tribute, if I could have my pick from any of the bands, I thought uh, you and Gavin, Gavin Pring, uh -huh. and I was thinking, you know, that guy who's with the bootleg Beatles is pretty good. <laughs> and then, like a year or two ago, he joined the band. Yeah, he sure did, yeah. Which, I, I, I got a kick out of that. <laughs> Well, for years and years, that's all we saw on YouTube, you know, any of our YouTube uh, videos or any of the videos that the Bootleg Beatles had out, it was always, hey, if Adam only joined the Fab Four, hey, you guys should get Adam from the Bootleg Beatles. That's all we saw online all the time, and then boom, it happened, and people were, like, freaking out. I was probably one of those people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, he's, Adam's a great guy, he fits in great with us, um, right now because of the whole issue. You know, he had to go back home for, for this particular thing with all with his family. But uh, as soon as things get going again, 
he's going to come back out and continue doing shows with us. But he had to go back home and take care of his family, which is in England. So right now he's a little bit we're – we're all on a hiatus, obviously. But yeah. he, he had to – he didn't have really have too much of a choice to get back, back home and take care of everything. I want to ask you another Fab Four question. So, oh, no, not the Fab Four. Oh, I know. Those guys. <laughs> Let's talk Rickenbackers and Hoffners. Oh, yeah. Oh, trust <laughs> me. <laughs> so, uh, 2007, you guys were approached by, was it Eric Idle or Neil Innes? Uh, uh, Eric, Eric Idle. It was all Eric Idle. <laughs> to kind of stop being the Beatles for a while and kind of do a, a Ruddles tribute. Yep. What was that like, being kind of directed by Eric Idle? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously he's a comedic genius. He really is, and it's really it's really uh, jaw-dropping and awe-inspired to see somebody like that work and come up with stuff. Because he wrote a script, and basically, what, if people are listening, the Ruddles were, uh, you know, a mockumentary of the Beatles. And um, so he wanted to... Do, to have an anniversary of sorts, um, which we came out in 78, so he was planning on this in 2000, 2008, and we would do an, a few shows in LA and New York, and he just wanted to do, have fun with it. I don't think he wanted it to be anything huge, he just, he just wanted to sp- pay, some, pay some homage to what he and, and Neil Ennis and all the other guys did. Uh, and for the Beatle fans, too, you know, cause we had a lot of our Fab Four fans going to those shows in, here in L.A., some of them going to New York to see the show in New York. We had a blast. It was, it was a lot of fun. I would have loved to have seen the show, although I was six. When oh, wow. Did it. Wow. That's I, crazy. I know I'm, I'm too young to do this. Well, you know, you never, it, 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 uh, it's never too late to get caught up, though, is it? <laughs> so... I ask this question to Mark, too. Uh, as part of uh, the aforementioned Fab Four, you guys are, in a way, carrying on the Beatles' legacy. Uh, how does that sit with you? That, to a lot of people, when they go see uh, your shows, you're an extension of the Beatles to them. And they look at you the same way they would look at Paul and carrying yeah. on the music. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because it's not our music. Obviously, that's the weird part. Um, I'm I, I consider myself, and all of us in the especially Ron and I, we we love the Beatles more than anything. The Beatles are the Bible to us. You know, they're they're everything. Mm-hmm. Like we were talking about earlier. So uh, I'm I'm biased in my love and, and support of everything they stood for. You know, um, for some people that saw the Beatles and they see us. There's a cool nostalgic twist to it that I, that I enjoy listening to. I like hearing their stories. Like, oh, we couldn't hear them. Obviously, they were you know, fifty thousand people screaming, but you guys sounded great. I'm assuming they sounded just as good as you guys did. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it, certain people, sometimes people could take things a little too far. Um, they, you have to know when to say when. And when the when we're off stage, we're not the, we're not the Beatles anymore. We're <laughs> ourselves. We don't talk in the accents. Once the boots come off and all that other stuff, we're off stage. We're ourselves, so people just have to know that that's that's how we approach it. We're we're going to give you a two-hour show and give our all, detail, 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 um, down to like I said, the boots, all the, the makeup, the guitars, the accents, everything we do, and everything's live, being performed by the four of us on stage, and and it's always been that way. So we take a lot of pride in that. And I think our reputation is because of that. The devil's in the details. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, kind of like what Mark and those guys do. Obviously, they do. They have a little different angle. They only mm-hmm. do the early stuff, which is great. But to me, it's about that devil. What about the rest of the song? What about the rest of the great songs that the Beatles had? You know, it's, it's, I think the audience wants to hear it all. I, I, that's just my thing. Mm-hmm. I'm not taking anything away from what those guys did mm-hmm. and, and, and keep doing. Uh, it's just not, I, I have a little bit more, I get more out of it. I have a little bit more gratification doing the entire era, so to speak. It's a little more from the uh, Beatlemania kind of angle. Yeah, yeah. I think people, yeah, I mean, how could you not play, you know, Sergeant Pepper and have a pepper suit on playing a Rickenbacker? I mean, how cool is that, you know? 
I as mean, someone just... who has played Sergeant Pepper in a pepper suit, I can attest to that. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just too cool. You know, there's only certain there's a there's certain certain bands that that have their forte, and, and like I said, more power to sixty four. They've done a lot of great things uh, in the tribute world. You you gave me a perfect segue when you were uh, talking there. You said that the Beatles were your Bible. Kind of on that note, uh, I want to talk about the Fab Four Christmas album. Oh. It, is, it is one of my favorite Christmas albums of all time. I oh, put cool. I, I put it up there with the Phil Spector Christmas album. Oh, wow. Thanks, man. That's very cool. How, how did you go about doing that? Well, I'm going to give credit where credit's due. I had nothing to do with the re- arrangements. That was all Ron. <laughs> Ron literally came up with that stuff in a few days. He... He got a call from a record company, which was called Laser Light, uh, and they wanted to do it. They wanted to see if, if we, because of our reputation, can do a Christmas uh, slant on Beatles. And of course, he said, "Yeah." And we we didn't we've never done that before. So Ron came up with all the different arrangements and the the, the tunes and the mis- mash mashups and all that kind of stuff. And boom, there you go, instant classic Beatle parody stuff, you know, for holidays. A particular standout is the uh, Jingle Bells Tomorrow Never Knows hybrid. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. There's some Uh, fun stuff on there. You have earned a place in my Beatles Christmas playlist, which you would think that the genre or the subgenre of Beatles-themed Christmas albums would be smaller than it actually is. Yeah, there's a lot, yeah. uh, I can think of, uh, like two or three other albums. I mean, not as good, but, you know. Yeah, it, I mean, people a, that love, sorry, a, people that love the Beatles are just, you know, they're going to, they're going to try to have a spin, whether it's Christmas or, <laughs> you know, anything to make it, uh, make it fun for other people. Okay. What is your favorite Beatles song to play live? Hmm. To play live, that's uh, that's a hard question. I, you know, I, I think um, when we do it yesterday or I started standing there for me or Day in the Life, those three. I, I can't pick just one. I know you asked for just one, but I think it's an impossible question. Um, I think Day in the Life is a standout because, again, it's just the four of us playing everything live. Um, our singing is live, every guitar lick, every bass lick, every drum fill, all the keyboard parts. They're all, everything's live, so it's always impressive to, to pull those off, that kind of a song off as a four-piece. Um, yeah, I try standing there just to get the crowd going. It's a rocking song. It's a fun one to sing and play. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot. But I think those end yesterday because of the, uh, the huge song that it is, is a, is a great moment, too. Now, on the other hand, do you have a least favorite song to play live? Hmm... That's tough. That's a harder question because I, everything we play is a Beatles song. So for yeah. me, I love them all, <laughs> you know? It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad song. It's just something where it's like you find it hard to play the bass line and sing at the same time. Or it's just... Mon- oh, Lovely or- Rita would be that song. That song would be Lovely Rita for me. Really? Oh, that's a tough song. Play, li- play left-handed and play all the licks, all the bass runs. And sing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and we did that whole album actually a couple years ago for the anniversary uh, on World's Greatest Tribute Bands on Access TV, and we did it entirely live in front of an audience at, in Hollywood, um, and that we pulled it off pretty well, actually. There's some good YouTube clips of that. I have seen those YouTube clips. They yeah. are very good. Yeah. Um, not from a playing live perspective, but what's your favorite Beatles song in general uh, when it comes to like listening to them? Um, if, if somebody told me that and I absolutely had to pick one, absolutely. You, you don't have to had... just pick one. No, no, I, I well, I, I, I could pick one though. I actually, over the years, I've kind of gravitated to all you need is love for a lot of different reasons. Not only do I love the lyrics and the melody, but it's kind of, it kind of encapsulates what the Beatles were all about for me. Just love. Yeah. Yeah. They were, the, it was the first, you know, live broadcast, satellite broadcast and, uh, that song and the Beatles were chosen for, for England to represent them. And that was, what a perfect song for that time, especially. I mean, 
I think they wrote it especially for uh, the TV broadcast because they wanted to write a song that would appeal to everyone in the world. Yeah. And I think they did a, a damn fucking good job. Oh, yeah. Like, how, how, you could not write a better made-for-TV uh, made song, you know? Yeah. And especially it was in the middle of the summer of love. So... Yeah. Everything was a little more, uh, let's say, lysergic. Yeah. And the stars had aligned, you know? The stars aligned for them on, on that particular time. <laughs> Do you have a least favorite Beatles song? Um... Not really. I, I kind of enjoy all of them, even like Revolution Number no. Nine. I can enjoy it, and, and for what John and Yoko were trying to do, you know, it's so wacky. But um, has the Fab Four ever tried to play Revolution Nine live? No, no. I don't think we ever would or could. That's just too crazy. That one's too crazy to do. Are there any other songs that uh, you just won't do uh, with the Fab Four? Um, like, have you done Wild Honey Pie? <laughs> I haven't done that one, no. And that's a weird one, too. Um, we would do it. Um, we've done Happiness is a Warm Gun. We've done a lot of that stuff off the White Albums. But, um, yeah, I, we know most of it. We know most of almost every album, except for, that, except for the White Album. That's pretty much the harder one. And Magical Mystery Tour is also one that we haven't really done every song on. We haven't done quite a few songs. Um, what's your personal favorite Beatles album? Ooh, another hard question. I, uh, you can pick more than one. Yeah, I'm going to have to say Pepper, Rubber Soul, and Abbey Road. Probably. Revolver's in there, too. How about those four? That's that's good, because I was going to get upset if you didn't mention Revolver. No, you kind of have to mention Revolver, yeah. It's, yeah. it's scientifically proven to be the best Beatles album. <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. I heard about that. That's, yeah. it's, I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. Great songs on there. Yeah, a study conducted by me. Where there I, you go. Where I interviewed myself. <laughs> and do you have a least favorite Beatles album? Um, least favorite would probably have to be... Uh, God, that's hard. Maybe Beatles 65. Maybe the Beatles for Sale. I, I mean, I love a lot of those songs, though. That's a, but there's so many, there's so many uh, cover songs still. They were still doing a lot of cover songs. So uh, I'd probably lean towards that one. Or maybe the second album in America. A lot more. I love the covers that they did, all the R&B stuff and, you know, Smokey Robinson. I love all the covers they did, but I like the stuff that they wrote in particular, uh, obviously, more, much more. Now it comes to my favorite part of the show, where I, I get to plug stuff for people. So, the Fab Four, you, you can't go out right now because of the pandemic, but isn't it true you are going to be doing something special within the next couple weeks? Yes. Um, I can't elaborate too much with it yet, but um, when we do announce it, you, could, you can find out about it if you're interested. Anyone listening, if you're interested, um, at the fat4.com or on Facebook or on our Instagram fat 4 band page. Um, yeah, it's going to be some really cool stuff. We've been rehearsing two days a week for the last couple weeks. And uh, let's just say there's some anniversary um, uh, influences in there uh, for Beatle, Beatle albums. I've, I've seen some pictures of uh, the rehearsal, and I'm getting a lot of uh, Twickenham Studios vibes. Yeah, 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 but uh, only we know what that is, right? Yeah, uh, right. You, you can hold your cards close to your chest on this one. Yeah, I'm going to have to until yeah. it's official, you know. And I'm going to plug this for you. If you, have, if you do not have the Fab Four Christmas album, you are stupid. Go get the Fab Four <laughs> Christmas album. It is... One of the best Christmas albums ever. Oh, thanks. We appreciate it. Is there anything more you'd like to add? No, I think that's pretty much it, Ethan. Uh, the main thing is always, like I said earlier, the Fat Four. We're just we're committed to doing a two-hour show the best we can to represent the Beatles' music and their personas, um, and give an audience paying their hard-earned money the best Beatles show they'll ever see. And I think you do a pretty damn good job of that. Well, thanks. Artie, thank 
Oh, sorry. Oh. I was just going to say, and we're hoping, obviously, to get out there again real soon. Hopefully, all this stuff, people do the right thing, and everybody can get back to work. Obviously, our industry, entertainment, will probably be the last to uh, really get back to work fully, but uh, we're hoping sooner than later, yeah. safely. Safely. I'm, I'm hoping, too, because I want to see you guys again. Well, thanks. Well, we're looking forward to it, man. And thanks for the uh, thanks for the interview, Ethan. And uh, you know, hopefully everything um, everything goes forward, and uh, people can tune in to our special show coming up real soon. Thank you so much for coming on. All right, man. You're welcome. You take care. You too. All, All right. right. And again. for those out there listening, thanks for listening. Uh, goodbye for now. The Fans on the Run is produced by Ethan Alexander. Additional voiceovers by Richard Phillip. This has been a Showtown production. See, what did I tell you? Great episode. You know, we laughed, we cried, and I think we all learned something new. What was your favorite part of that last interview? That was mine, too. Uh, it, you know... I, I, I'm really happy that I'm able to, you know, do this podcast because it gives me an excuse to talk to these Beatle people and all of you Beatle people, because most of you will probably end up being invited on the show at some point. That's kind of just a fact of how it is. But, you know, I, I love doing it. So thanks for listening. Uh, what do I what do I normally say? I, I'm I'm gonna stop saying it because it sounds stupid. Ta ta for now. Yeah, I don't like that anymore. So goodbye. Get out of here. No, that sounds too harsh. Uh, comment below what you think I should say at the end of episodes. I don't know anymore. I can't think for myself. Think for yourself, cause I won't be there for you. That, get it? It's the Beatles. Oh, God. It's it's late. All right. Thanks for listening. 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 Listening.